So <clears throat> that'll be two weeks. Uh, of course, the Tuesday of that week at 8 is our final for this class. So, um, and a couple people have asked, what about the material on the lectures from when I wasn't here? Yes, that will be included on the exam. And I'm still bugging Dr. Ruedas to get that posted, his PowerPoint. Um, he hasn't given those to me yet, but I will continue to bug him. So um, speaking of questions and exams, uh, let's jump right into it. Clicker questions, I promised adenovirus clicker questions. So the adenovirus genome replication is protein primed, RNA primed, DNA primed, or some combination thereof. I think that's a new kind of virus. We have to invent that one. Fifteen, ten, <sighs> um, the answer is yes, protein primed, and there's no RNA priming having to do with anything as far as these guys are concerned. Got a few questions to get through today, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time um, talking about the answers. If you have questions about that, um, just raise your hand, slow me down. Okay, so let's show these. Next question, adenovirus capsids have blank symmetry, helical, quasi-equivalent icosahedral, pseudo-icosahedral, no symmetry, only two-fold symmetry. Interesting. This started out about 50-50 between the quasi-equivalent and then shifted over to pseudo. So I guess discussions are a good thing. Yes, it is um, the pseudo icosahedral symmetry. Why? Multiple different proteins, hexons and pentons. So <clears throat> the late proteins in adenovirus are produced by different start codons, overlapping open reading frames, alternative splicing, alternative tailing, C and D. F. It's always F. Always F. Button down here. <laughs> 
10. Okay, most people when they think about adenovirus, they think about alternative splicing, but it's also alternative tailing because it's just one big transcript. The major late promoter makes one big transcript, and so it's both alternative splicing and alternative tailing, which are important for that. So now let's fast forward about a week and a half and ask questions about the RNA viruses from last time. That most RNA virus, oh, most single stranded RNA plant virus genomes have caps means that they replicate in the nucleus, replicate in the cytoplasm, encode a capping enzyme, have multiple genome segments, and they use iris. Ten, time to start guessing. So most of you agree with me, yes, it's about encoding capping enzymes. Uh, they need to have caps so that they can replicate in the cytoplasm, um, and they're not the cap-stealing versions. All of the cap-stealers we've talked about have been negative strand RNA viruses. So, um, and... Well, so, but they, can all, they could also seal caps, and we didn't talk about them, but there are also viruses that steal caps in the cytoplasm. Do some of that as well. So just very, very briefly, we talked about that. Those are the bunya viruses that we didn't have time to talk about, the ones that give you really nasty hemorrhagic features, and maybe Doc uh, Reda's talked about, but I seriously doubt he talked about cap stealing, because that's not his thing. <laughs> Cute, fuzzy animals, yes. Cap stealing, no. <clears throat> CCMV changes shape of its capsid when heated up, cooled down, pH changes, salt concentration changes, C and D. person change their vote. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> yes, you've obviously been able to read your notes from last time. It's both. Tobacco mosaic virus was first thought to cause disease like we now know a blank causes disease. E. coli bacterium influenza virus bacteriophage T7, prion, HIV1. 
I'm not sure about the T quote seven here. That's an interesting new virus. <laughs> it's the T prime seven. Fifteen, ten, so yes, it's pro all thought to be protein, so just like prions are causing diseases. So um, with that, sorry for keeping people who have to leave after clicker questions for so long. Sayonara. Have a good weekend. Um, and we'll move on and talk about what I think are some of the coolest viruses ever, um, which are the giant viruses. These are viruses that people are discovering all the time. They're really starting to blur the difference between what's a cell and what's a virus in terms of size, in terms of genome, um, what's in their genome. These are really starting to make this whole, you know, what's a cell, what's a virus become a really open question. So these are the really big DNA viruses. Most of them are icosahedral, and in fact, I should have changed this. Um, at least the ones that we knew about until last year were all, are all icosahedral. It's changed, of course. Um, some of these giant viruses are important for climate change, which is really pretty wild that virus infections are involving, you know, huge both local and global climate modifications. They've got ginormous genomes, and again, the question immediately comes up, um, what's a virus? Unfortunately, one of my colleagues, Eugene Koonin, came up with this absolutely ridiculous acronym that is impossible to pronounce unless you have a really strong Russian accent, I think. So the NCLDVs. So these are the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. It's an, I don't like that at all. Gyruses, um, which is what one of my other colleagues, uh, Jean-Michel Claverie, came up with. I think it was way better. But unfortunately, that's what seems to be sticking in the literature. Uh, these guys are really everywhere find them all over the place, and it's very often people just looking for not the standard viruses, those that are causing human, animal, plant diseases. These particular ones have mostly just been found by people looking at things that cause amoebal or algal diseases, and it's amazing that they found all these new viruses that are infecting amoeba, and probably if they looked at other organisms, they'd be finding tons of new viruses as well. Most of these even the brand new ones have an internal lipid, which is also, again, a lot like cells. You've got a lipid sort of membrane on the inside with proteins around that on the outside. Um, and then, at least for the Mimi virus, these guys infect by also the Stargate mechanism, which, again, wasn't a terribly good movie or TV show, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but it's a really fascinating mechanism that you have uh, genome release. What are these? LNCDVs, actually, so I did this, I did that incorrect, like, you know, so this is just to be the, so I always mix, mix this up as well. So it's the NCLDVs, uh, because it's the nuclear side applies to large DNA viruses. Um, they're the FICO DNA viruses, um, FICO being algal, and so these are DNA viruses that are infecting algae. Um, some of these, at least until the algal, the, sorry, the amoebal viruses came along were the largest viruses anybody knew about, 
Coccolithoviruses, these are the ones which are really important for climate change. They infect some of the algae in the oceans, particularly some of the diatoms. And we'll see why that's important for climate change. Probably the most famous until recently were the Mimi viruses and then the megavirus. These were the viruses that were mimicking bacteria. That's where Mimi comes from, is the mimic of bacteria, because they're as big as bacteria, their genomes are as large as bacteria. And for a long time, people thought they were bacteria because viruses can't be that big, or at least the virions can't be that big. Um, but more recently, we have the Pandora viruses, and just about two months ago, the so-called pithovirus. Uh, these are even larger virions, and in the case of the Pandora viruses, the genomes are even larger than some of these megaviruses in well. In fact, some of the Pandora virus genomes are larger than the smallest eukaryotic genomes, which is, again, pretty amazing terms of these things. Um, pithoviruses, these have now the largest capsid size. These were found in a sample from 30,000-year-old permafrost. You may have heard about this. Uh, and again, just published literally a couple of months ago. The other thing I wanted to talk about here, even though these aren't the large nuclear cytoplasmic DNA viruses, um, these are viruses which infect those viruses. And so how can you have a virus infecting a virus, right? Uh, well, that gets back way back to our sort of definition of viruses right at the beginning of class. It's not just the virion that we're talking about. Viruses is that whole virus life cycle. And so if you think about a virus infected cell as being part of the virus life cycle, you can clearly see how viruses can then be infecting those virus infected cells. And that's what these things um, here called virophage um, we'll talk about right towards the end um, today about. First start with the phycoDNA viruses. It's in fact what the book chapter, unfortunately this is such a fast moving field that any kind of literature is kind of out of date by the time it gets published. Uh, but at least there's some on the phycoDNA viruses which are in there. These are algal viruses and in this case it's eukaryotic algae. Uh, these eukaryotic algae produce about 50% of the world's oxygen. 20% of those are killed each day by the algal DNA viruses, so you can do the math, you see that about 5% of the world's oxygen comes from these viruses and the um, infections that are important for that. So um, phycoDNA viruses are critical for at least global atmosphere. If we look at the relative <clears throat> relationships of these, say, now at least I got it back correct, the nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses. Uh, at first, people knew about some of the pox viruses and baculoviruses, which were slightly related to each other. Um, more recently, they found these insect viruses. Baculoviruses are also insect viruses, by the way. Um, iridoviruses, again, having some similar genes relative to each other. And then, really in the last 10, and in some cases, last very two or three years, um, people have found some of these other really enormous viruses. The phycoDNA viruses are about 400 to 500 nanometers in diameter, which is getting close to some of the smallest bacteria. Mimi virus is 700 nanometers in diameter without the threads on the outside, so that's getting close to some free-living bacteria. And some of these Aspharviridae, which are, curiously enough, some animal viruses as well. Uh, this tree is put together from some of the conserved proteins that are present in all of these different genomes. There are not very many of them. There are only about five or six that are similar, but they're similar across all of these different viruses. And so people think that means they had some kind of common ancestor probably a really long way back. Start out talking about PBCV1. This is the classic phycoDNA virus. Um, it's really easy to work with, which is nice. In fact, this is from my lab. These are some cultures that we have growing in there right now. This is the host for these phycoDNA viruses. They grow in chlorella alga, which live on the inside of paramecium. And so here, this is an image of paramecium up here. A little hard to see at the top, but all these green things in the paramecium are the chlorella alga, which live inside the paramecium. But you can also grow them on the outside of the paramecium. And that's what you have here on this plate. And basically, this was all developed by a fellow who is now at the University of Nebraska, uh, a guy by the name of Jim Van Etten. Basically, took all the bacteriophage methods and just used the algae instead of the bacteriophage. And it turns out pretty much any freshwater pond, you name it, you go to, you can find algae in it. 
Um, you can spread them out on plates and you'll get these plaques which will represent um, various different viruses. Uh, at first they just saw that these were really big viruses. Um, then they sequenced the genome and they found a couple of really interesting things in looking at the genome. Uh, don't expect you to read this whole thing here, far too much details, but a um, couple of interesting aspects about it. Uh, one is it's not like a bacteria, most of the bacteriophage genomes, in that it has these closed hairpin ends. And we're going to talk more about hairpin ends when we talk about archaeal viruses next week. Um, but what a hairpin end is, is it's basically a sequence which is continuous all the way from one strand back to the other. So it has no, basically you can think of these things either as a circular single-stranded DNA genome that's completely complementary to itself, so it just binds, um, or most people talk about these as linear double-stranded DNAs with covalently closed ends. So there's these loops um, at the end that go from one strand back to the other. Uh, they have long inverted terminal repeats, which again should sound familiar as far as the HIV, the retroviruses. The really bizarre stuff was what was actually in the genome. It wasn't so much the structure of the genome itself. Eleven tRNA genes. In fact, I think this is the record so far for a number of tRNA genes encoded in a virus genome. And it's not surprising that the codon usage in this virus genome is very different than the host codon usage. And so you have to have different tRNAs for different codons. And so it turns out that when you have a virus infection, to get good translation of those viral genes, you need the tRNA genes that are encoded for on the viral genome. When people first found this, it's like, wow, no way. You know, translation's all supposed to be cellular, right? Well, being modified clearly quite strongly by this virus genome. Also encodes ubiquitin, or in a ubiquitin-like protein. How important that is for virus function is not clear, but ubiquitin was also thought to be a cell-only protein. Lots of transporters. Again, you know, metabolism, these guys are supposed to be metabolizing, right? They're viruses, you know, they don't metabolize. But these are very important um, for apparently getting good replication of the virus genome. Also have some interesting self-splicing introns in the genome. And curiously enough, um, Dr. Lehman here in the chemistry department has been working a lot on the, one of the self-splicing introns that comes out of um, this particular virus genome. Uh, so the genome is really fascinating. The structure, because at the point that they found it was actually one of the largest structures, turns out that it's extremely similar to all of the other icosahedral viruses in terms of how it's being put together. It's a pseudo 54 equals t equals 54 particle, major capsid protein that looks almost identical to adenovirus, hexon protein, STIV, my, one of my favorite archaeal virus capsid proteins, and also PRD1, a bacterial capsid protein. So double beta barrel sticking up from the surface, um, highly glycosylated, and at first people thought this was a nice regular icosahedron until they did a reconstruction in the cryo-EM where they didn't assume that all of the vertices were the same and then they saw this little spike structure um, coming up here at one end. Um, this is just a blow up of each of those trisymmetrons or these uh, trimers of these proteins that are coming together in order to form the general repeating structure that you have in this icosahedrally symmetric um, virus. We know quite a lot about binding and entry for this virus. Um, you can see on the right hand side here, this is just a set of <clears throat> pictures, EM pictures, thin sections of the virus infection process. You know, you have a virion on the outside of the cell. It breaks down the cell wall. Algae are very similar to plants in that they've got, say, eukaryotic algae anyway, um, very thick cell walls that are really hard to break down. So it seems that this particular virion is acting a lot like a lot of the bacteriophage, even though it's bigger than most bacteriophages, a couple of exceptions to that, uh, but really much bigger than most bacteriophages. So that's that spike, and it turns out there are enzymes in that spike that are involved in breaking down the cell wall. So it breaks down the cell wall and then basically releases its genome at the plasma membrane. 
So again, it looks a lot like a bacteriophage in terms of, of how it's doing its replication process. Um, there are a couple of other things that happens. Um, this is now infecting a eukaryotic cell, but it's a large DNA virus. It requires a number of things that are present in the nucleus in order to be able to replicate. So once the genome is released, it still has to get transported to the nucleus, and then the host DNA is degraded in a manner really similar to what happens in a lot of bacteriophage as well. Um, it's not a modified DNA, and quite how you make sure that you're replicating virus DNA and not breaking that down turns out to do with some restriction endonuclease-like enzymes that are present and encoded in the virus genome. When you put together PBCV1, it's assembled as these large icosahedral particles inside the cell till you get to a certain level and then basically, again, a lot like a lot of bacteriophage, you have lysis of your cells. Again, you can see that in the plaques that they were able to make on lawns. Um, and then you have the virion release that takes place. So PBCV1, really big virus that's infecting eukaryotic alga, but replicating a lot like a bacteriophage. So that's, in fact, probably the vi one of these giant viruses that we know the most about is this PBCV1, again, mostly through the work of James Van Etten and his colleagues at the University of Nebraska. And there's a really nice website here. I wanted to put it up, um, pbcv.org, for Paramecium brucella. That's the Paramecia that I showed you at the beginning. Chlorella, which are the algae which are inside it, virus. So um, Paramecium brucella, chlorella virus. I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about the coccolithoviruses. There's also covered a little bit on your, in your text about this. Uh, <clears throat> So these are coccolithophores. These are really classic marine alga uh, that have these wonderful silica plates um, on the outside. Uh, and you can, in fact, see these when you look out from space down on our planet. You can see a lot of these coccolithophores. But the white stuff that you're seeing there is actually not coccolithophores that have all these plates on the outside, it's coccolithophores that have been lysed by the infection of one of these guys right here. So some people talk about this as a, you know, the biggest viral plaque in the world, <laughs> um, if you look at this. And so these are blooms of this particular coccolithophore, which is one of the most prevalent in the oceans, Emiliana huxleyi, uh, and then getting lysed by bacteria, is not bacteria, by the uh, virus on the outside, and that releases all of these guys. And then there's also, there's a, I don't know if anybody here is into comic novels, but there's a little comic novel about, you know, Emiliana huxleyi and the viruses that they're infecting with each other. I'll, uh, I'll post that on, on the D2L site. It's really kind of fun. Uh, that whole process. So uh, this, you can see that you're having this big change, um, and you can see that you have all of these virus lysis events that are taking place. Uh, some people say that it's really the White Cliffs of Dover, and these famous White Cliffs of Dover in England, are in fact due to these events, which have now precipitated down to the bottom of the ocean, then get lots and lots of these stacked on top of each other, and then have gotten uplifted. And so uh, most of the White Cliffs of Dover are due to viral infection. The other thing which is really important about these um, coccolithophores and what happens when you get viral lysis is that what happens is you get release of dimethyl sulfate. Dimethyl sulfate is a really good nucleating agent for getting water vapor to condense. Well, what happens with water vapor condensing? You get clouds. And clouds, you get less of the growth because you have less light coming through. So if anything, it's, a, it's really a self-regulating cycle at the climate and atmosphere level. So you have Meliana huxleyi growing nicely. You'll have some kind of bloom. We've got a massive amount of E. huxleyi that's growing. Did anybody make it to the biology seminar yesterday? Um, we actually talked about algal blooms, admittedly, mostly in 
freshwater systems. Uh, but you have these algal blooms. We're not quite sure why. A lot of those algal blooms are then removed by virus infection. But that virus infection here, in the case of E. huxleyi, releases dimethyl sulfate. That then gets up into the atmosphere, causes cloud formation. Cloud formation blocks the sunlight, so you have less growth of these organisms. So first, you're killing them off with the viruses, and then there's less growth that's happening as well. So it's a really nice feedback system, if you think about it. Um, so that's one aspect of these viruses. The other thing is, of course, we look at the genome, what's present in the genome of these viruses. These ones were really interesting because they had, to start with, like a lot of viruses, and we'll get back to this more later on, 80% um, of the genes in their genome match nothing else in the databases, which is really kind of surprising, um, at least at the time. Now, more viral genome sequences, it turns out this is not that unusual at all. Uh, they encode their own RNA polymerase, I mean, in fact, all of the subunits of the RNA polymerase, and it turns out that that RNA polymerase is not that dissimilar from the pox virus RNA polymerases. Um, so it also gives you an idea that these guys are related to each other. It's kind of bizarre that you know, pox viruses, again, infecting animals very specifically, and then these viruses that are infecting algae, which is one reason that people think that this particular family of viruses could be a really, really old family of viruses because they've been around for a really long time. Another thing which is interesting, particularly for my lab, because we're interested in really old viruses or virus biosignatures other than, you know, white cliffs because you have all this virus lysis taking place. Uh, turns out that these viruses change the lipid composition of the host that they infect and also their host lipids. And so all of the viruses we've talked about so far, it's just been host lipids that get taken up by the virion. Well, in this case, it's a host lipid that gets modified by an enzyme produced by the virus that then gets incorporated into the virion. And why we're so interested in this is it turns out that lipids and lipid degradation products are really well preserved in the geologic record. So you've got lipids that go back billions of years. And so if we could find virus-specific lipids in billion-year-old rocks, that would potentially tell us something about those viruses actually being around at that really ancient period in time, which is important on this planet, but of course we're also looking on other planets for various different lipids, biosignatures, et cetera. So we think this is a really potentially interesting um, virus biosignature. Turns out that the EHV genome also encodes a number of proteins important for apoptosis. So it causes the host to undergo apoptosis, which is why you have that release of all of the um, plates, which then form these, these huge plaques. So um, in terms of climate change, again, we already talked about the change that you get in DMS and then change in terms of precipitation. But one of the big problems that we need to be worrying about, I think, is what's happening in terms of ocean acidification. So hopefully with uh, everyone knows that increasing CO2, what happens in terms of increasing CO2? You have more carbonic acid in the oceans. That's lowering the pH, and that actually will probably change the amount of these precipitates, which are on the outside of a lot of these coccolithophore algae. And so a number of you know, climate change scientists are almost more worried about ocean acidification than warming in terms of the atmosphere. Because it could really change a lot in terms of, you remember, you know, 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere is being produced by these guys. If they don't have those plates on the outside, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. So there's some really interesting issues about what's going on with some of these viruses. Now I wanted to switch gears a little bit and then talk about even bigger viruses, these are the Mimi viruses or the viruses which are mimicking cells. This is one of the very first electron micrographs. This is Mimi virus itself here. The virion, at least the icosahedral part, is only about 500 or so nanometers across. But as soon as you start to look at where these threads are, we're talking about almost a micron in diameter. So these are big viruses, really big viruses. Um, also, again, as Jean-Michel likes to call them, the gyruses, or as he would say, gyruses, because he's French. 
Um, so um, these are all found in amoeba. Um, so the two groups, in fact, in France, curiously enough, in Marseille, they don't talk to each other because they have differences of opinion. Um, both of them really fabulous work. Um, they started out looking at amoeba, and particularly they were interested in some of the intracellular bacteria that were in some of these amoeba and some intracellular bacteria which are causing disease, rickettsias and chlamydia, a lot of the standard, if you want to call them that, uh, diseases that are due to these uh, intracellular bacteria. And they started to look at some of these viruses, and they were really surprised to see that in some of these amoeba, they had these virus-like particles that were present inside them. And at first, people thought these were, in fact, bacteria. And, you know, we'll see that in just a second. Um, one of the things that I think is really, really cool about these virions is you can see them under the light microscope. So these are light micrographs up at the top here. Um, this is from um, 2007. Um, but each of those little bumps that you can see there in phase contrast is a virion. And so at first, you, know, you have to have an electron microscope to see virions. Well, no, that's not true anymore. You can see these guys, in fact, under the light microscope. Um, it's phase contrast on the right there. On the left is just one of these staining um, assays with nucleic acid binding stain. And so each of those little dots is going to represent a single virion there. The other thing which they found when they were looking at these is that what happens when you have a virion that associates with a cell, that then basically converts the whole cell into what people call the virus factory. That's what the VF up there in black stands for. And so the whole cell is shifted over to making virus particles um, and virus genomes and is not replicating itself anymore. So I mentioned that you know, people thought these were bacteria. Uh, in fact, there's a paper in 1992, which publishes this interesting bacteria that they found in an amoeba, you know, inside the amoeba cell, and then it was shown to be a virus only 11 years later. Um, <clears throat> so this is, in fact, not the same cooling tower, but um, one of the cooling towers. The original reason they were looking at these things, curiously, was an outbreak of Legionnaires' disease. Um, and they thought that there was, you know, some kind of amoeba association with that, and then they isolated this bacterium. Um, they thought it was a bacterium and no correlation whatsoever they could tell with disease. And then, I don't know the whole history of this, but they eventually figured out that these were viruses um, pretty soon thereafter. Uh, this is a micrograph of variola, which is the pox virus. Um, basically, for comparison purposes, um, these guys, and if you look at, I think, so is that the next micrograph? No, I don't have the next micrograph here. Some of the micrographs you'll see of Mimi virus actually have this sort of bilobed shape in them, which also is an indication on the inside of that icosahedral particle that these things are related to each other. Um, so virus in 2003, they're really huge particles. It's just another example of the virus factory and some of these individual virus particles um, inside the poor amoeba here. Uh, the burst size here is about 1,000. You get you know, really massive numbers of, of viruses which are being produced um, by these amoeba. But the genome was probably, I think, the more amazing at least at the time, um, thing that people found. The uh, genome of Mimi virus is over a million base pairs in size, uh, which is much bigger than a number of smaller bacterial and even some archaeal genomes. Almost all of it is coding sequence, so again, a lot like a lot of the bacterial genomes, very unlike the amoeba, which it's infecting. Amoeba have these really massive genomes. They're, you know, hundreds of gigabytes, or gigabase pairs, I should say, in size, um, compared to ours, which is you know, three for the haploid genome and six for the diploid genome. So these amoeba have genomes that are tens, almost, in some cases, almost 100 times as big as ours. Uh, but most of that's non-coding sequence. On the other hand, these viruses are almost all coding sequence. They encode RNA polymerases, again, similar to the pox viruses and similar to the EHUX viruses. But they have a whole bunch of proteins that are involved in translation. And this was the very first viral genome known to have amino acyl tRNA synthetases encoded in the genome. So not just encoding the tRNA gene, but also 
the enzyme that takes the amino acid and puts that onto that appropriate um, tRNA. It's got quite a few tRNA genes, although, as Jim Van Etten will always point out, there are more tRNA genes in his phycoDNA viruses than there are in Mimivirus, a um, few fewer that. There's some cap binding proteins that are present in the Mimivirus genome, and even some translational initiation factors. So um, here, EIF4A, there's an EIF4A homolog in the Mimivirus genome. There's an EIF4E homolog in the Mimivirus genome. So again, getting back to what we talked about right in the beginning, our virus definitions, they're all dependent on host translation. Well, at this point, they're all dependent on host ribosomes, but pretty much everything else. And they don't all have full complements of tRNA. And one of the big questions is when is someone going to find a virus genome that has a ribosomal RNA gene in it? So far, nobody's found any. But I'm not going to bet much beer or money on um, how long it's going to be until they find some of those things. Um, there are a few gene duplications in the genome. For fact, first people thought, oh, all this is is just a whole bunch of gene duplications, and that is going to be what's making this really big genome. It turns out there are actually not that many. Um, gene duplications. A lot of the genes that are in here are really pretty unique. And also, going back to what we saw in the E. Hux virus, you know, between 70 and 80 percent of the genes in this genome don't have any homologs anywhere else in the database. So this is the slide I thought I had a little bit earlier. If you look on the inside of these icosahedral particles, they've got a membrane on the inside, and then Inside that membrane, you also have some of these structures in the middle. Sometimes these look a lot like what you see on in the inside of pox virus particles. So again, um, the outside of pox viruses, pox viruses don't have a really regular um, structure on their outside, nothing obviously symmetrical. But on the inside, they have these pretty defined structures. Here. The structure is icosahedral. It's a pseudo-1179 structure, which is really you know, pretty insane. But it tells you that that assembly, you know, we talked about T equals 1 icosahedral way, way, way back when. And you can go all the way up to 1179 and still have this assembly process. Don't ask me what the H and K are. I'm not going to ask you. Those aren't exams either. Uh, but it's exactly the same kind of organization of those capsid proteins. Um, one major capsid protein that has a huge amount. There are two lipid bilayers on the inside of these particles, the proteins on the outside, two lipid bilayers on the inside. Again, this should sound a lot like some of the bacteria, partly why people thought that was the case. And then this protein core. And so that protein core is, again, a lot like what you see in the pox viruses. Um, fibers on the outside, nobody's really quite clear what these fibers are doing. May be important for mimicking bacteria or for just getting the amoeba to take up these massive virions in the first place. And so amoeba are usually eating by phagocytosis. And so presumably what's happening here is that the virions are in the environment where the amoeba is. The amoeba actually try, try and eat the viruses, and then the virus then will fuse with the membrane on the inside of that phagosome and escape. And so this is where we get to the Stargate, so how they're doing that process. So <clears throat> this is, uh, in fact, not a Stargate. This is from another movie. Um, some of you may recognize here, but I think it's really similar in terms of what's happening here. So if you look at um, some of these virus particles, here's a mimivirus virion on the inside of one of those phagosomes. What happens is it opens up completely. Um, hopefully this is, you know, well, this is, there aren't too many kids in class today. That's what we're saying. This is family friendly. Uh, but it opens up, and then this protein core is, in fact, released. And that opening process um, people found, I think about four or five years ago now, that one of the vertices of this icosahedron is not the same as all the other ones. It has the sort of star shape to it. Um, and if you look up in C, up at the top here, or in A, you can see that one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, clearly five-fold axis because it's a five-pointed five star, is different than all of the other axes. 
and then you get this fusion process that happens right here. So this is the thin section, and this is a SEM where you're looking at this. <clears throat> So this is then a reconstruction of what they think is happening here. And so I thought the comparison between this one and that one was uh, really pretty similar. Uh, the infection cycle of these viruses is you know, not terribly different from a lot of the other infection cycles we've talked about. Up in A there, you see where one virion is getting picked up by the cell into a phagosome, fuses through this Stargate process, and then from the Stargate then uh, is releasing the genome, this you know, really proteinaceous state. That comes into the cell, forms a virus factory, makes many, many more virions, and after 12 hours you see the lysis that takes place um, of this <clears throat> particular cell. So Mimi virus was where it was at 10 years ago. That was the giant virus. Well. We only just started to look at viruses of these amoeba. So a couple of years later, um, the megavirus came along. Everyone wants to be bigger and bigger and bigger viruses. So the megavirus has a slightly larger genome than Mimi virus, seven amino acyl tRNA synthetases. 23% of its genes actually don't look like Mimi virus at all, which is really kind of interesting, um, I think. And that means that there are related to each other, but still only distantly related. Yeah? Uh, you said that word was that, that AATRNA synthetase. Oh. What is the AATRNA? So AATRNA synthetase, amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So that's the enzyme which puts the amino acid onto the tRNA. Uh, and was always thought of as being something that was purely cellular. Well, the first amino acyl tRNA synthetase found in the virus genome was found in Mimi. And it turns out these guys have seven of them. Um, but the viri virion looks extremely similar here. It's not a terribly good electron micrograph, but it's got a protein core on the inside, two lipid membranes, an icosahedral structure on the outside of regular capsid proteins, and then these fibers that come off of them. So let's see, October 2011. This was the biggest virus until, uh-oh, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is the Pandora virus. This is from last year. Um, these are really bizarre. Also, again, originally found by people who thought they were bacteria. And again, not terribly surprising because, you know, does this look like a virion? Heck no, it doesn't look like a virion at all. Um, and again, you can see it under light microscope. You know, these are regular you know, phase contrast uh, microscopy. But it turns out that these guys replicate in a viral fashion, and you can in fact see that here, um, where we have the infection process, not shown here in the original paper, uh, but <clears throat> there's this one vertex, or the plug, as people they call it here for these Pandora viruses. Uh, that plug then associates with the vacuolar, the phagosomal membrane. That's what you can see up here. The genome is released, and then you get formation of lots of these individual particles. And then the amoeba is lysed, and all the particles are released. And so you go through that whole process again. Uh, you can also look at the proteins that these viruses make, but the really huge surprise and huge being not an overestimation here, was the size of the genome. You know, this genome is two and a half million base pairs in size, which is, again, really kind of amazing. The smallest eukaryotic, they're admittedly endosymbionts, um, have smaller genomes than this. In the paper, it's that science paper, which you can access here, by the way. Any, if you're on campus, you can access all of the science and nature papers. Um, only 7% of the genome is similar to known proteins. That's a bit of a cheat. Um, if you actually read the paper, they say, well, we screened out all of these things that were only similar to conserved domains. So again, when you, when you say you know, how many percent similar, how many percent new, it all depends on how you do your analysis in terms of what percent new. But it's clearly very different sequences, 
but nonetheless clearly related to the Mimi viruses and the other viruses based on those conserved proteins like the RNA polymerases and some of the DNA polymerases which have similar sequences to each other. The few genes that are similar to those known proteins are in fact related to those. Yeah, question? The ends of the genomes here, so, you know, okay, you may notice that here there's a gap right up at the top. So these are linear genomes as well. I don't know about the end structures, whether those have um, covalently closed ends or whether they're open ends. That I don't know. Uh, yeah, I could find out, um, but I'm not sure about it. So it's well known for the PBCV viruses. Those then have these, you know, closed ends. But for these viruses, I'm not sure. Um, they might, but again, I don't know. Um, off the top of my head. So the that diagram goes, right? Yeah. Um, so it depends if it's like circular, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do, do both sides, do both strands go? Yeah, and so, okay, so the, the only reason this thing is drawn as circular here is it's to get everything on one page, <laughs> um, to shrink it down a little bit. And so what's um, being shown here is all of the blue bars are proteins that are coded for in one strand. And all the red bars are proteins that are coded for on the opposite strand. Number two here is they didn't just find one of these viruses. They found two different ones, one of which with a slightly smaller genome, um, but still um, over a million base pairs in size. And it's those genes that are similar between the two are those that have colored bars um, right in here. And then these are repeat sequences, which is um, present here. Uh, on the, the most innermost ring. Um, and that's all um, in the paper here. So one of the things that those authors really were pushing is what they call a fourth domain. So three domains that we know about now, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Because there are so few similar proteins that they find in these genomes, for not just this virus, but the Mimi virus and the megavirus and all of these other viruses, is they think that these are now viruses that are derived from an extinct lineage. Now, I don't necessarily buy it. It's one of the things that, and we can discuss at length about why I'm not so sure about that, uh, but this particular group really thinks that this is evidence for a a fourth domain um, of life, as they call it. So <clears throat> the uh, last one that I wanted to talk about was the giant virus that was discovered literally a couple of months ago. Actually, it was older than that, but it was published a couple of months ago. Uh, and this is the pithovirus. And I love this image because this is the relative scale of the pithovirus virion versus herpes simplex, which is a pretty big virion, and the HIV virion. So it's really a, a pretty um, amazing in terms of its size. And then I, this is the Stargate. So this is the reconstruction of the Mimi virus particle with that very different single five-fold axis, um, which is present on just one of the five-fold axes of symmetry. And that's what opens up and then releases the, the protein, which is present um, on the inside here. So the Stargate there, that's where you're releasing the genome from. So since we can't get that other one, we'll do the very last, which is the megavirus discovery. French scientists are excited about a new virus. It's the largest one ever found and is discovered off the coast of Chile. Scientists say the megavirus can help develop research into the possible usefulness of viral organisms. Megaviruses pose no threat to humans. Let's take a look. This megavirus was discovered by scientists during an expedition off the coast of Chile. This is Marseille, by the way, Chile not Chile. It's larger than the previous record holder, Mimi, and it's a very complex organism. The biggest virus in terms of particle size, okay? It is a small, it is a little uh, bigger than the 
produce mini virus, but it is also more impressive in terms of uh, DNA and uh, genomic. So, Jean Michel got cut off. Oh well. Uh, so be it. But I do recommend taking a look at that slate video um, in terms of it's got some really cool animations of the virion, but also some interesting commentary that you can guess whether I believe or not. <laughs>